The 2023 NBA draft cycle is officially underway, and so is the race to see who becomes the next number one pick. We know who the two favorites are, but this is looking like one of the most stacked classes in a while, and we're going to have full coverage of it in season 3 of Floor and Ceiling. That starts today with part 1 of my preseason big board, so stay tuned because we're going to have breakdowns, updates, and much more. For now, welcome back to Floor and Ceiling. Let's break it down. The number one spot is Victor Wembanyama's to lose. The French phenom is as hyped of a prospect as we've ever seen, but I really think the circumstances exist for him to solidify his incredibly high stock this season. Wembanyama moved to Metropolitan's 92 with the idea of being featured in a more prominent role, so by the time next summer rolls around, we'll have an even better idea of where his skill set stands. Until now though, he's dominated at every level. His measurements obviously stand out, and there's a lot of talk. Is he 7'3", 7'2", 7'4", 7'6"? But my takeaway really is that we've never seen somebody in today's game with Wembenyama's blend of size, mobility, and two-way potential. Starting on offense, this is where the 18-year-old has flashes of just about everything, and not just for a big. Let's start with the spectacular, which is really that Wembenyama quite fancies himself as a perimeter-oriented player. This of course can lead to some tantalizing sequences off the dribble where Wembenyama shows us that a human being that large and that long should not be that coordinated. In all fairness, the percentages have never been great historically. Last season, which is the biggest sample size that we have, Wembenyama shot 25 for 91 from 3, about 28%. This season so far, he's been a bit better from deep, but it's so early that we can't really read anything into it. Still, I think the mechanics and form are easily repeatable. Wembenyama's jumper is genuinely close to unblockable, and the touch, in my opinion, clearly exists. In the short term, making these wide open stationary threes is going to be important for him. Not just when it comes to the NBA, but also right now to open up more spacing for himself in the French League. Back when we took a look at Evan Mobley, I mentioned that one of the things I loved the most about him was that he had so many avenues to success. Mobley was incredibly versatile on both ends of the floor, even if he was still quite green in his only year at USC. I think Wembenyama is similar. We've seen the promising pull-up, the flashes from three, and some stuff off the dribble. But Wembenyama also needs to make sure he keeps it simple sometimes and sticks to the basics. He could be anywhere from 7'2 to 7'6, so it doesn't get much harder than just catching the ball and putting it in the hoop sometimes. Rim running, catching and finishing, playing above the rim. In the NBA, I suspect we're going to see Wembenyama in the pick and roll quite often, and hopefully much more of him rolling to the rim with a more spaced out floor. Very quickly, I want to touch on Wembenyama's passing flashes. Without focusing on the numbers as much as the tape, Wembenyama has shown to me that he understands some reads and passing angles. The Frenchman can get creative given his length and find passes at angles that would often be tougher for smaller players, so this is definitely something to keep an eye on. As for improvement points, I think the biggest ones right now are related to Wembenyama's strength and toughness. This was a big point of discussion about Chet Holmgren last year, unfairly so in my opinion, but I do think it's something to monitor for Wembenyama. If we look at his free throw numbers, they've always been incredibly low for someone who plays the 5 most of the time. More than that though, Wembenyama just has a really tough time playing through contact. Right now, he finds it hard to stay on balance and get to his spots, even if his defender is giving up size. The second item I want to see improvement on also goes back, I think, to his strength. Wembenyama can still be too loose with the ball at times, and he must play stronger. It's just that he needs to make sure he is securing and keeping the ball. This is incredibly obvious with his rebounding, as we can see, and quite frankly, he's going to really have to improve on it in the NBA. Defensively, this is where Wembenyama should be absolutely awesome. Sometimes he does try to block or affect absolutely everything, and he plays a bit too rashly, but that's mostly because he wants to make a play every time. As he gets older, he'll understand that sometimes making the simple rotation and not leaving your feet is enough. But other than that, Wembenyama again shows intriguing versatility across the board on this end of the floor. He can guard in space and has great foot speed relative to his size. Sometimes being 7'4 does mean that he's a bit slow coming out to the perimeter, but overall I'm not too concerned about this, I mean just look at it. 
his freakish length, but also recognition and awareness, also shows up at the rim, where Wembenyama can erase everything at the basket, and I think he's a surefire bet down the line to be an all-defense level player. Victor Wembanyama should be the number one pick, but I think Scoot Henderson of the G League Ignite has a higher chance at overtaking him than a lot of people are giving him credit for. Henderson joined the Ignite program as a 17 year old and had a really impressive first season. Now he's back and fully expected to be his team's most important player. First, I want to highlight how efficient Scoot is with his length when it comes to finishing at the basket. Henderson made a monster 75% of his twos over 21 games last season. I love these flashes because not only is he an awesome vertical athlete with great speed, but Henderson is so shifty and sudden with his strides. He covers so much length and then can come up with some tough finishes and really big dunks. At 6'2", Henderson is not massive for a guard, but he plays bigger than that given his 6'9 wingspan and ferocity attacking the basket. Of course, like we're seeing, this is something that can really be taken advantage of in transition. But what really appeals the most to me is how Scoot can use all of these things that I just talked about against more of a set defense in a half-court setting. He's super young and he's already doing some very special things. One of Henderson's strengths that surprised me last year was his pull-up game. Like I said earlier, he made about three-fourths of his two-pointers. More than 60% of those were unassisted, and Henderson loved getting to his mid-range shot quite often in his first year as a pro. You're gonna get tired of me saying this, but I cannot understate the maturity and composure that Henderson plays with for his age. He's younger than Wembenyama, for instance. But going back to the midi, this is where Scoot really shines. His pull-up is smooth and pretty consistent for where he is and his development. It has a high release point, so pair those things with the jumper also being hard to block. What I like the most is how Henderson changes speeds. He doesn't get rushed too often, and he's already able to get into his shot in a variety of ways. Scoot can decelerate coming out of screens, or rise into his jumper out of those hang dribbles he often uses with his long arms. His shot diet is probably a little too reliant on these shots, but I think these flashes are very valuable. We're gonna have to see how the numbers hold up this season, but that mid-range ability can be very useful in tight games or playoff situations. The one thing that I'll really be looking out for this season is whether or not the range extends out to 3. So far, that's been a struggle. In his first year for the Ignite team, Scoot shot about 22% from 3. Henderson only had 11 makes all season, which is obviously something to build on. Simply put, it's tough for point guards in today's NBA to be successful if they're not comfortable from the perimeter. Given what we've seen from 2 and his solid percentage from the line, about 78%, I'm confident that he'll get there eventually, but I'm unsure about the level of outside shooting this upcoming generation of the Ignite team has, so any improvements from Henderson would be absolutely huge. And if he starts making pull-up threes like this, his potential is tantalizing. My number 3 prospect is Asar Thompson out of the Overtime Elite program. This is yet another different path to the NBA, but I love Thompson's potential as a hyper-athletic wing with guard skills and in my opinion, some lead creator potential. As we're gonna break down, Asar's shooting has to come on leaps and bounds, but let's start in transition where he gets downhill and makes highlight-worthy real plays every night. The OTE environment leads to a lot of play in the open court, but I think Asar's tools here can translate to just about anywhere. He's too right-handed for my liking right now, but Asar is persistent and always forcing the issue even while being a non-shooter. Thompson can still get downhill on switches or when he comes off screens. Really, he just needs the slightest separation. Asar is a blow-by threat all the time, and this has shown up in every environment so far, such as the tournament or overtime's European friendlies earlier this summer, but I think he also plays with some underrated finesse. In regards to his playmaking, Asar is less of a natural facilitator than his brother Amen, but he's not a non-passer. As we look at these clips, the first of which come in transition where he's also a skilled facilitator, the one thing I noticed about Asar is that he really tends to pass to his right. Despite that, there are two things I really like about his playmaking. The first is that he understands that he's a threat when he gets into the paint, and then once he draws attention, he can find the right option when he generates the advantage. The shooting must improve and we'll get into that, but even then, Thompson is such a threat that defenders are already thinking about the rotation they need to make to stop him when he gets into the paint. If help doesn't come, then he can just about beat anyone to the rim. 
and if help does come, he's Flash being able to find the right man with some creativity. The second note is that Thompson can pass with one or two hands. Just throughout these clips alone, we can see how Asar can make a two-handed touch pass in transition, but he can also break down the defense in the half court and laser this one-handed pass to find the three. Don't get me wrong, he's not a perfect passer as we'll break down over time, but I have no huge concerns. However, there are two areas of growth I really want to see Asar emphasize, and both relate to his scoring. The first and the most noticeable is his jumper. At this point, he's close to being a non-shooter on an NBA court. Thompson shot just 24% from 3 and 65% from the line last year. The other thing to keep an eye on is Thompson's inconsistent finishing. Asar has awesome tools to attack the rim, we've seen that, but he shies away from contact sometimes, and he'll really need to just rev up that motor all the time. Asar, like I mentioned, really loves going right, so it's not a huge surprise to me that his improvement areas at the rim are most obvious when he goes left. Finally, we'll quickly look at the defense, but I'm not sure how much it's worth buying into under the OTE umbrella. Thompson definitely has versatile potential, probably able to guard all the way from the point of attack to a lot of fours down the line given the way the game is headed. The one thing I want to highlight for now is the rim protection. Given his athleticism and 7 foot wingspan, it's no real surprise that Asar led OTE in blocks last season. Thompson had 2 games with 7 blocks, and I love his help D in particular. Just take a look at some of these clips. So even though there are areas that Asar must keep growing in, namely the shooting, I really do love his two-way potential, as an uber-athletic wing who can handle the ball and whose tools can be used in many ways, even if the OTE environment does make him a more challenging evaluation. I'll just come out and say that I'm really high on Dariq Whitehead, higher than most people I think, so I have him placed at number 4 on my preseason big board. Whitehead is one of the youngest players in the draft, and he doesn't even turn 19 until next August. He underwent surgery on a foot fracture recently, but he's still expected to start playing for Duke this very fall. My vision for Whitehead is that he can become a really lethal pull-up shooter with legit gravity who can also handle the ball and sprinkle in some additional playmaking. As we're going to get into shortly, passing is never going to be his bread and butter, but it doesn't have to be given the caliber of scorer that Whitehead might become. So let's break down some of his tape. First of all, the confidence shooting stands out. At 6'6", six six, Whitehead is not shy about letting it fly. His pull-up has legit range, and personally, I like him best when he operates just off one or two dribbles. At Duke, I'm not sure how much Whitehead is going to play the guard or handle the ball because of their roster, but right now, I think that's where he's at his best. However, it's important to look at him in multiple contexts since those opportunities could be limited. However, I do think that he's going to be fine and he's going to be able to show that he can play on and off the ball as a guard. Getting into his passing a little bit, I think it's underrated. The 6'6 guard doesn't really make any mind-blowing reads right now, but I think Whitehead is a fairly safe passer. Once he gets into the paint, he can play with his head up and find his man. And even though he's mainly known as a scorer right now for a reason, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a non-passer. Looking at things he must work on, the first is the shot selection. And much like Thompson, he does have to improve his finishing at the rim. Right now, like a lot of young players, he has a tendency to shy away from contact at the basket. Rather than try to draw the foul or go through his man, he's going to try to lean back and toss up a shot off balance. Like I said earlier, I like Whitehead's passing flashes, but he does commit his share of turnovers and a lot of them come when he plays out of control. All of this is fixable and the game is going to slow down over time. That will come. But for now, there are times where Whitehead is definitely a little loose or a touch high with his handle and that can lead to a turnover. At number 5, we have Cam Whitmore, one of my favorite wing prospects in this upcoming draft. The Villanova freshman will still be 18 by the time next June rolls around, but he's already built like an NBA player, at 6'7 and a strong 232 pound frame. Right now, Whitmore is at his best in the open court, and usually that means transition, where he's comfortable handling the ball in space, 
powerful using long steps, and capable of changing directions while maintaining that explosiveness. I'm using these clips from All-Star Games because of copyright reasons, but these concepts apply across the board in any environment. Even though Whitmore can come up with some awesome highlights, what I'm going to be looking out for him is improvement in the half court. Villanova constantly churns out NBA pros, so I'm not worried about that. But I do think that Whitmore has to show more off the dribble, primarily as a pull-up shooter. And the Maryland native is also going to need to tighten up his handle. It can still be loose and high. However, I think that Whitmore has a clear path to a high draft spot in 2023, and he's going to be looked at as somewhat of a Jalen Brown type of prospect, who of course has to get better as a shooter, but he's also shown enough for me at this point in time to buy stock. And while Whitmore develops his shot, he can score in other ways, be it cutting off the ball, attacking closeouts in short spurts, or punishing mismatches. Defensively, and really overall, I still want to see the new Nova wing in a more competitive environment. The likes of Michigan State, Oklahoma, or UConn should be great tests to see where Whitmore really stands. But for now, I'm all in on the tools, the length, the mobility, the pop, the flashes of shooting, the transition scoring, the tenaciousness. I'm all in on it, and I can't wait to watch Cam Whitmore at Villanova. As always, thank you for your continuous, undying support. I know we've been gone for the last few months, but we're back now, and I'll be back on camera later this week in Las Vegas when I watch Victor Wembanyama and Scoot Henderson go one-on-one -on -one for what should be the only two times before the 2023 draft. I'm excited, I'm looking forward to this new season, and as always, if you enjoy the content, make sure to subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you guys next time.